All right. Hello, hello. Good evening, good evening, and welcome. Um, so I hey there. Good evening. Uh here we are, ready to get started on a new week and um you know, ready to to go ahead and work on a new topic. For this evening, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. And if I can call it that, also a bit special. As well, there are, you know, many things, many skills that we are supposed to learn when we are on the road of learning um, a new language. It's not only for English, but basically for all languages that, you know, we can try to learn out there. But whenever we do that, there is always this skill that we all uh, take for granted and that for many people, many, many people, it has been one of the keys when it comes to learning a new language. The thing is that uh, many of us just don't pay attention to it. We simply feel like it's boring. That's like the best um, adjective or the most common adjective that people use to describe this skill. Tonight, we are going to be paying attention to the less appreciated skill of uh, um, languages. It's not only for English, but languages in general. Of course, tonight we are going to be talking about uh, this skill, or, or we are going to be practicing this skill in English, uh, which of course is, you know, the objective that we have, the language that we want to learn. Therefore, um, yeah, it's the one that we must pay attention to, because of course, we're not going to be, um, you know, paying attention to like, Spanish lessons or Spanish courses, we are um, focused on learning English. Therefore, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and, as I said, pay attention to the least appreciated skill. And when I talk about skills, I mean things like speaking, writing, listening, and in this occasion, reading. So we do speaking almost on every class. We do... Um, writing sometimes you know when we like write sentences or examples is not that common but we at least do some writing we do uh listening a lot in my opinion but what we almost never do is reading and on friday i was basically left alone only with raul and we had a little of a practice you know we were practicing a little bit of reading uh with short paragraphs and that's what basically made me think that maybe it was time for us as a team to go ahead and practice reading in general, like all of us, you know, having a reading practice. So tonight is going to be basically about you. It's going to be about, um, well, your practices. I am going to be a mere listener. I only want to like, you know, share maybe a little bit of the um, instructions or some instructions for some of the words that we're going to be looking at, but the class is going to be mainly, mainly about um, reading. So we have, let me check back again. I think it's five paragraphs or four. No, it's only four paragraphs. So we have four paragraphs that we're going to be practicing. Uh, and yeah, that's basically going to be what we're going to do. My dream would be that everyone has a chance to read each paragraph um, we're going to see if the time is enough for us to do that because I want you to practice as much as possible. I know that it's going to be very hard, you know, that you give attention to reading once again after tonight because, yeah, it's basically what happens. So I want to try to make the most out of this evening for you guys to go ahead and um, and have as much time to practice reading as possible. Now, um, there is, of course, something that I want to do before. And it's the question for the evening. And this time around, I actually have the question here written down for you. Um, so I want to hear, well, let me see one sec. I want to hear what are your wishes or your desires, your um, ideals in life? What are the things that you want to achieve? So basically, you know, this is the question for tonight. Tonight, I wanted to do a little bit different. I wanted to like, you know, share you the question right, um, right on. So yeah, now something important that I need to remember or mention as well is that, um, sorry, is that I might have issues with my internet and electricity tonight because there is a big storm coming near my house. 
So hopefully it's not going to happen. Hopefully we're not going to have any issues, but it's the possibility. The possibility is there. So if by any chance, you know, I ended up um, getting disconnected, please don't, don't rush. Don't worry. I'll be uh, back as soon as possible. But for starters, what are your wishes? What are your desires? What are the things that you want to achieve in your life? Um, I want to hear uh, your answers. And probably we are going to start by hearing from um, Rodrigo Mendoza. So in your case, Rodrigo, what are your wishes, the wishes that you have? Good evening, teacher. Um, mm -hmm. In my case, my wishes are speak English uh, because it's important uh, in the actually. Uh, for example, when I want to go to other 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 job, for example, mm -hmm. uh, when I decide to go at other country, it's important to speak English with um, speak with other uh, people, uh, right? Uh, for this reason, I decide to learn English. Uh, I am honest, I don't like English, but I decide to learn uh, because I think that it's important uh, for actuality. Okay, great, very good. Yeah, it's it's true, you know, it's very true. Uh, learning English is one of those things that might not be easy, uh, but still, we have to try, we have to, you know, do our best. Um, in my case, there is one language that I have never really liked, and it's French, but I have this dream of mine. I think I, I shared it with you guys last time that I want to move to um to Canada. So since a few weeks ago, I have started, you know, um trying. I'm not saying that I'm doing it like for real, but I'm trying to learn um some French because yeah, I have heard that you know that's basically uh like this the second official language in in Canada and if I want to make it true at least I want to take I gotta take some steps you know towards the goal so yeah sometimes we have to do some sacrifices we have to try things that we might not like but it's it's because we have that uh idea that is going to help us in the long run so yeah I know that you know many companies nowadays they require you to have at least an intermediate level when it comes to um to an English level um, and yeah, traveling abroad is probably one of the most common things why people say that they want to learn English, because this is basically the easiest language to communicate with um, overseas or wherever you go. So it's also, you know, a great and very clever idea there because, yeah, English is very, very useful when it comes to those two things. So great. Very good. Thank you very much for sharing. How about in the case of Raul? How about you, Raul? What are your wishes or desires in life? Okay. My wish my wishes are for example I like to travel to other country specifically Peru. I don't know I think that Peru is is a fantastic country and and I and another uh, wish uh, another uh, Wishes for me, uh, I learn English because I know that uh, for me the English is difficult because when I when I the when the people uh, talk English, uh, for me is difficult to to listen because I I don't I don't know that the people are are, uh, are speaking, but my my but. I I like to learn English a lot, and also uh, I like to I like to um, I don't know that uh, build my 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 house for example because uh, I I would like to to uh, build my house and and I would like to my house uh, my house uh, would be. Uh, big uh, and big and and that's it okay great yeah i mean um visiting other countries or going to other countries is great because we have the chance to like see life through different eyes probably after we do that you know we have the chance of like experiences experiencing how other people live how other people eat 
how other people work. So we see different things when we travel to another country. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Even traveling in our own country makes us, you know, see things in a different way. Um, and of course, speaking English, as I said before, is one of the most required skills nowadays. It's one of the dreams for many people. So yeah, it's, it's you know, an amazing um, thing to do. And of course, it's not easy because it comes with some sacrifices, but still is something that um, we have to try to do. We have to do our best and uh, enjoy the road uh, as much as we can. Then the other thing is um, building a house. Well, with the prices nowadays, it's going to be a tough one. But I feel like, you know, many of us have that desire as well. The desire of getting a house, uh, starting a family maybe. But at least the house part, you know, it's it's probably a bit hard, but um, it's reachable with effort, um, trying day by day so we can make it. So hopefully, you know, in your case, you're going to make it as well. So let's see. Uh, I say as well as if I had the house already, but I do not. Anyway, uh, how about um, Hared? In your case, Harit, what would be your wishes or desires in life? Uh, good evening. Evening. Uh, my wishes are uh, continue uh, learning English and uh, traveling in other countries. Uh, uh, and my family uh, enjoy uh, uh, good health. Buena salud. ¿Cómo se dice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good health. Good, yeah, good yeah. health. Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> es todo. <laughs> okay. No, that's great. You know, you mentioned the most important parts. Um, learning English, traveling, visiting new places, seeing new places, and also one of the most important pillars for people, for anyone, which is, of course, the family. Um, sometimes we turn it a little bit into a sort of cliche. Some people also make it, make it a joke. I do it sometimes with the uh, Fast and Furious movie, the Toretto thing. So sometimes I'm like, yeah, it's for the family. But no, being serious, it's an important part of us. You know, it's something that we, of course, need to consider always and uh, to know that the family is important and, and, and uh, being alive and well with them is, of course, key to our own um, well-being so yeah it's um, something that as much as we can we can try to like or should actually try to help family uh, whenever they have like you know mild illnesses because those moments are when family becomes stronger and becomes of course more and more important okay uh, we're gonna hear for two more people and one of those is gonna be Karen in your case Karen what will be your wishes or desires in life? Hello, good night. Good night. Um, well, I think I have a lot of wishes, but right now I think that I really want to have a promotion in my job, in my in my uh work, mm -hmm. and um a big salary increase, of course. And uh, definitely I would like to continue. I took two months uh, French classes and I'm agreed with you because it's, it's difficult. The pronunciation is really difficult. Uh, when I was trying to talk um, in French, uh -huh. I was talking English, French. I do so sometimes... <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard, and the pronunciation. Well, uh, it was so difficult for me. I try Portuguese, but mm -hmm. unfortunately, I couldn't continue. But I think Portuguese is easier. Very and if you know Portuguese, time. yeah, mm -hmm. if you know Portuguese, it's gonna be easier uh, to learn French. Oh. Um, but yes, I would like to uh, learn at least two languages more. Mm -hmm. And definitely increase my um my vocabulary mm -hmm. in English. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Um the great thing about languages, or at least those languages are are that uh they are basically family, you know. If, yeah. 
I, I don't know if you guys have any like background on that, but most languages or the languages that we share or we know from around us are related among themselves. For example, English is a mixture. English is like a blend between Spanish, Italian, French, and German. So they have words and structures that come from all of those languages. For example, you guys have seen so many of the um, the words that are similar between English and, 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 and Spanish. And uh, of course, that also gives the space um, to go ahead and have the false cognates, the words that have a similar structure but a uh, very different um meaning in the end but the thing is that um that is supposedly that is why when you are learning french you do the english french thing because the structure is basically the same like the grammatical structures they are basically the same however the words are going to be completely different um and uh, portuguese is also there you know in the middle it's like also one of those that is like a little bit of a mixture um because they say that spanish and italian are like the oldest ones or the eldest ones in this case because it's a plural so they are the eldest ones because they come from way back you know those two have been evolving and uh, changing through time for a longer period than english has been because english actually is a copy, as I said, it's you know, it's just a like um, it was the newest kid in the block when um England found um the the land that now is the U.S. So if it wasn't because of that, probably English will have already disappeared because many people have the idea that French should be the official language, the French should be the language that was spoken, you know, um throughout the world. Because it, so it was basically um, the most important language in Europe when the colony started, because it was also the most spread one. Uh, French was the country that has the most colonies around the world. But then England, you know, they found a way to get colonies to start sharing their language. And that's how they ended up creating the U.S., the, the, the titan that the, that the U.S. is right now. And that's why English got as popular as it is but if it wasn't because of that maybe instead of english right now we will be learning french you know if it wasn't because of the colony if it wasn't because of like all those um domination periods probably right now we will do more french than english but anyway uh they do relate they are very similar and that's why for many people you know it's like it's like a series of steps like you start with spanish we start with spanish we have that as a starter package then we can move on into Portuguese. Then maybe we move on into Italian and then we can move into French. And that's like how you're escalating. And they say that it's way easier to learn German than French. I don't know if you have heard that, but they say that German, even though it seems complicated, it's way easier to learn that uh, than learning French. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a tough thing. It's a tough situation probably for Latin Americans, people here, Normally, when they hear something as uh, what you just mentioned, Karen, that, that the fact that you want to learn two more languages or you would like to learn two more languages, um, they feel like, you know, like we are crazy just because we want to learn more. But in other countries, people who know seven languages are average. Like I have a mm -hmm. friend who is she's fi Finnish. Um, she's from Finland. And she's, she once told me that she was basically one of the worst in her class um, when it came to talking about being, you know, ab able to know languages or able to speak languages. And I asked her why, because I thought that maybe she was simply bad in English. And she was like, no, because I'm the only one who doesn't know more than seven languages. And I was like, what? Like, she was 17 years old. She was a high schooler back then. And uh, she already knew German, French, Finnish, of course. Um, she knew... I, I don't remember how they called it the language in Sweden, but the one they speak in Sweden. Um, she goes in new English. I think I, I did already mention that. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, Spanish. She also knew Spanish, and I think it was a little bit of Portuguese. But she said that most of the classmates that she had, they all knew at least ten languages. And I was like, what? Like you guys are only eighteen years old, seventeen years old, and you know ten languages already. 
And she was like, yeah, because we live in Europe, you know, and Europe has many languages. So if you want to travel, you don't want to sound as, as a foreigner. You want to be as uh, native as possible, because if not, people are going to bribe you. People are going to uh, maybe take your things from you or sell you things for um, a higher price. So it's better if you know as many languages as possible. And, and where did she live? In Finland. Finland. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't. Well, I don't do... think that is crazy because I, I have a, a co-worker mm -hmm. that she is is spoke five languages, mm -hmm. five, and I have another one um that speaks uh, Portuguese, English, and Spanish, of course, and uh yeah, many people that speak uh, French as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, but in my case, the reason why I was, you know, like so amused was that I was considered a special in my university because I knew English. You know, I was being mm -hmm. a teacher in the U.S. because I knew English. And she was just uh, an intern. No, she was not an intern. She was an exchange student, a high school exchange student who actually knew seven languages. And I was like, I was surprised, you know, because she was, as I said, she was only 17 years old. So it was actually a surprise. And as I was saying, I didn't believe her at the beginning. But then one day I started to, to speak in Spanish with her. And she was actually able to like keep on with the conversation. The only thing that mm -hmm. was funny was that the R's are very, very hard for them. Like they pron over pronunciate the R's. Like instead of saying um, Oscar for my name, she mm -hmm. will say Oscar. Oscar. So it's mm -hmm. because of the languages that she knew mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. R's, she really rolled the R's a lot. Um, so yeah, the conversation was funny whenever there was like an R there, but it's impressive, you know, how some other countries, they, they pay so much attention to those things. And uh, yeah, we only do one thing and maybe we consider ourselves, you know, great because we're doing one thing. It's not that I'm, you know, like depreciating what you guys are doing, but, you know, it's only sharing a little bit of what's happening around the world. So yeah, but okay. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, one more, the last person. I think we are going to hear from Jonathan. How about you, Jonathan? What are your wishes or desires in life? Hi. Good hey evening. Well, I'm so individualist person. I want to finish my engineering degree to work remotely. I want to learn English to create content for social networks about tourism in our country and when I travel to another country to be able to tell about my experience getting to know new places. So I dream of visiting Russia, Finland and Germany to see medieval castles, try many types of foods and clothing. Also climb it mountains and volcanoes in these countries. All right, great. Uh, now, as you mentioned, the fact that you want to create content for social media, I got to say, you have a great voice to do that. You know, you have the voice Thanks. that I would like to listen to when I watch. I mean, I love watching videos um, like blog videos related to traveling. So, you know, it will be a very entertaining video if it's, you know, like with such a narration as your voice. So it will be great. It will be amazing. So hopefully you make it true. And, uh, you know, you can say my number if one day you go to Finland, I can, you know, set you up with some people there because I know like five people from from finland um because yeah they're they're really cool you know people in finland they seem to be um cold and and like distant that like that's how you perceive them in the beginning um like the vikings yeah that's you know, so true in, they blow this mm -hmm. that's so true because yeah. when i when i uh you know first met that girl i always felt like that i felt like she was just you know so like i don't know like um I will say it straight up. I felt like she hated me because she was like always looking at me weird and all that. But then I started, you know, talking with her and it was great. You know, she ended up becoming a great friend on my stay in the U.S. And uh, yeah, she's actually a great person. I don't know what she's up to right now, but uh, people in Finland, they are cool. You know, they are pretty cool. But okay, uh, so thank you guys very much for sharing. And now we're going to move into what I said that we were going to be working on tonight, which is talking about wishes. I'm mean, sorry, talking about um, reading. So the way this is going to work for tonight, I am going to be doing the proof reading, which basically is, you know, the first 
um the first run and then um i think voluntarily it would be the best thing you know voluntarily i will let you guys go ahead and pick a moment when you want to read so you can have as many goals you know on your own and then you can do it um voluntarily but yeah i will do the first run just as a proofread and then you guys go ahead, you know, and start to do your thing. So Rodrigo, give me one sec. I will do, you know, the first run and then you have your chance. Or did you want to share something different, Rodrigo? No, okay. Hola. Bueno, si es de la lectura, como les digo, yo voy a hacer la primera, um, el, 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 lo voy a hacer una vez. Y luego ya les doy el chance a ustedes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, the United Kingdom. This is the first one. The United Kingdom is a country in Northern Europe. It is actually a country made up of four different countries. England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. This is why the full name of the United Kingdom is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. The United Kingdom has been a very important country in the world since the, uh, since the 1600s. It was especially powerful in the 19th and 20th century when it had colonies around the world. Colonies are countries that are ruled by another country. When the United Kingdom was at its largest, it ruled one fifth of the world's population. Today, the United Kingdom does not have many colonies. It is, however, still a very influential country in the world. Throughout history, the people of the United Kingdom have been leaders in many areas. They have been made, um, they have made important contributions to literature, philosophy, science, and math. A contribution is something you give, usually ideas or money. Perhaps the most important area of contribution was the Industrial Revolution. So there you have it. Seems pretty easy, right? So now I think, Rodrigo, if you want to still be the first one, you can go ahead and you uh, and do, sorry, your, um, your go. Hello, Rodrigo Hernandez. Mm-hmm. The United Kingdom is a country in the northern of Europe. It's actually a country made, made up of uh, different countries, England, Scotland, Wales, and North Ireland. This is now the full name of the United Kingdom. It's the United Kingdom of Great Britain and North Ireland. Yes, Rodrigo. Hello. Hello. Yes, yes, yes. So the United Kingdom has uh -huh. been very important country in the world. Size the 1600s. Okay. Continue. It's basically all the way to the end. So, la idea is to escuchar todo hasta el final. Ah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when the United Kingdom was its largest, it grew one fifty of the world population. Today, the United Kingdom does doesn't have many colonies. It is, however, is still a very influential country in the world. Throughout history, the people in the United Kingdom have been leader in the many areas. They have made important contribution to literature, philosophy, science, and math. 
A contribution is something you did, usually ideas or money. Perhaps the most important area of contribution was to the industrial revolution. Okay, great. Very good. Now, um, so we did great. You know, there were only a few words that we kind of stumbled upon, but still, you know, we did a great work. And uh, now the idea with reading and my advice for all of you is that, um, you know, keep on trying it, keep on doing reading. It doesn't matter that you get stopped by a word or two, but continue on, you know, continue on, continue on and always um, try to do your best. In your case, you did great. I like the way how you pronounce some of the difficult words that we had here. So that's great work. Uh, and yeah, I hope that, you know, we can just continue on going and uh, practicing as much as possible. So, um, Evelyn, you will have your chance, but first we're going to give the chance to Jonathan, okay? Because Jonathan was raising his hand before. So, Jonathan, um, you can have your go with this one if you want. So, go ahead when you are ready. Me? Yes. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, go ahead. Then. The, the, United, the United Kingdom is a country in Northern Europe. It is actually a country made up for different countries, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. This is why the full name of by the United Kingdom is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. The United Kingdom has been a very important country in the world since the 1600s or 16,000, I don't remember what is the pronunciation of this year. 1600. 1600s. It was especially powerful in the 19th and the, and the 20th centuries when it had colonies around the world. Colonies are countries that are ruled by another country. When the United Kingdom was at, was at its largest, it ruled one-fifth of the world populations. Today, the United Kingdom does not have many colonies. It is, however, still a very influential country in the world. Throughout the story, the people of the United Kingdom have been leaders in many areas. They have made, a, made important contributions to literature, philosophy, sciences, and a match. A contribution is something you give usually ideas or money. Perhaps the most important area of, of contribution was to the Industrial Revolution. Okay. Good, that very good. All. Great. That was a nice page. You know, was a nice page reading. Um, sometimes, of course, we can try to like, you know, take some stops, take some pauses. For example, here, this is like a, a one of those moments when, you know, the, 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 the paragraph wants you to make it dramatic. So if you say throughout history and then you make a pause there, you kind of like establish a different sense and uh, you make the, the listener um get like a different feeling from what you're gonna say so if you say something like that throughout history make a short pause and then continue on because that will make um as i said the whole paragraph sound completely different sound even more important because it means that it's something that has been happening for basically all of the time that the country has existed uh now this word this is one of those tricky words see esta palabra es compleja Uh, ustedes ven que se escribe así, vea, literature, pero se pronuncia literature, sí, literature. No sería literature, sino que literature. I used to say literature as well, and I will not blame you for that. But yeah, the way that this word is normally pronounced is going to be literature, as well as this one. It's science, science, and math. Esta simplemente es como si fuese una Z al final, math, sí, math. So yeah, literature, philosophy, science and math so yeah but the rest it was pretty good very well um uh, very very well done now um evelyn do you still want to do your run okay okay go ahead then okay the united kingdom the united kingdom is a country in northern europe is there actually a country made up for a different country england scotland Wales, and northern ireland This is this is why the full name of the United Kingdom is the United Kingdom of Britain and Northern Ireland. The United Kingdom has been a very important country in the world since the uh, 1600. It was especially powerful in the 19th and 20th centuries when it had colonies around the world. 
colonies are countries that are ruled by another country. When the United Kingdom was was at the salaries, it ruled all, it ruled one fifth of the world's population. Today, the United the United Kingdom does not have many colonies. It is, however, it is still a very influential country in the world. And so throughout, throughout history, the people of the United Kingdom have been leaders in many areas. They have made important contributions to, uh, I don't know how to say it, literature, literature, philosophy, or uh -huh. Literature. Liter literature. Okay, literature, philosophy, science, and math. A contribution is something you give, usual either for money. Uh, perhaps the most important area of contribution was the was to the industrial revolution. Okay, very good. Great, great, great. So um here the only one that I want to you know to clarify is this one. I forgot about this one as well. This is a struggle. I know what it is. This is basically like, you know, having a tongue twister. Recuerdan el que les mostré la semana pasada, ¿verdad? El jueves. So basically, this is something like that, but in, in a mini scale. Because, um, yeah, what it says here, or what or how it should sound, is at its largest. So at its largest. ¿sí? Eso sería, at its largest. ¿Y qué significa eso? Bueno, eso se utiliza cuando, eh, cuando se dice, o cuando se utiliza, cuando queremos decir en su punto más grande, ¿verdad? Eso sería para, para este caso. Ahora, si cambiamos el adjetivo y colocamos, qué sé yo, tallest, sería en su punto más alto. Sí, at its, to at its tallest. Pero entonces, esto se va a utilizar para referirnos como al momento más emblemático de algo. Sí, eh, puede ser, o sea, el más grande, más largo, más costoso, eh, más sencillo, más pobre, anything so at its and then the adjective uh will be used to describe that you know like that special moment special occasion um in something so yeah uh, now voy a pasar de al, al siguiente a la siguiente lectura porque así tenemos verdad eh, oportunidad de practicar no solo una sino que um algunas de las cuatro que tengo so then maybe you guys can you know pick the ones that are left at the end oh lo otro que les quería mencionar antes, perdón, es esto de acá. A ver, así como está aquí, 19th and 20th centuries, es fácil, ¿verdad? 19th and 20th centuries. Pero esta otra, esta otra forma es una que pocas veces practicamos y es una que, créanme, que es muy útil, muy, muy útil. Esta se utiliza eh, más que todo, o más bien, en el momento en el que ustedes tienen números, eh, pasando ya, claro, de mil. O sea, si hablamos, por ejemplo de 1100, 1200, cuando tenemos esas cantidades, las, los centenarios, podemos utilizarla. Esto se puede utilizar aproximadamente hasta que llegamos a los 9900. Sí, hasta 9900 podemos utilizar esta forma. Y se los digo ahorita porque es algo muy útil y que ustedes lo van a ver en muchos momentos. A ver, pero ¿cómo se pronuncia entonces o por qué se usa así? Pues bueno, en inglés ya sabemos que en aras de facilitar, ¿verdad? la utilización de números, en lugar de decir 1,600, ¿sí? nos tratamos de ubicar de otra forma. Normalmente, ¿qué se hace cuando tenemos estas fechas de cuatro números, cuando hablamos de 1,700 y algo? Pues lo que hacemos principalmente cuando hablamos de una fecha específica es que lo dividimos, lo vamos a ver en la siguiente lectura. Pero en esta, no hacemos eso. En esta lo que decimos es 1,600. ¿sí? Es casi como si estuviésemos diciendo 16 tienes. Entonces, por eso solo se puede utilizar esta forma cuando los números al final de la cifra son ceros. O sea, y por eso les digo, solo podemos utilizarlo al llegar a 9900, porque pasando de ahí ya no se va a poder. O sea, 9900, ¿cómo sería? Sería 9900. ¿sí? ¿Cómo podríamos decir entonces, um, qué sé yo, 8500? Bueno, 8500. Oh, thank you. Okay, so am I still here? I think yes. Sí, verdad. Bueno, se fue la luz un momento, but I think we're still alive. We are still here. Um, so, le estaba diciendo, esa sería la forma. 
¿Cómo puedo decir, por ejemplo, o en momentos en los que sea más útil? Cuando estamos hablando de números un poco más pequeños. Eh, por ejemplo, si fuese algo como um, 3,500, ¿sí? Yo digo 3,500, ¿sí? 3,500. Así que es una forma, créame, muy, muy útil de utilizar los números, más que todo cuando estamos hablando de cantidades. ¿Puede ser utilizado para dinero? Sí. Por ejemplo, si alguien les pregunta a ustedes, ¿cuánto les costó el carro? Y el carro costó 6,800. Ustedes pueden decir, oh, 6,800. Sí, 6,800. En lugar de complicarse y decir, oh, 6,800. Sé que para muchos pueden decir, ah, es lo que yo conozco, lo más fácil. Pero esa otra forma, pues está ahí, ¿verdad? También disponible para poder utilizarla. Así que aquí sería 1600, ¿sí? Muy bien. Vamos a lo siguiente, entonces. Uh, the next one is... Oh, wait. This one. Uh, Megaland Sales. Sí, Megaland Sales. So, Megaland Sales. In the 16th century, a nature of great marine and territorial exploration... Ferdinand Megaland led the first expedition to sail around the world. As a young Portuguese noble, he served the king of Portugal, but he became involved in the quagmire of political intrigue at court and lost the king's favor. After he was dismissed from the service by, um, service by the king of Portugal, he offered to serve the future emperor Charles V uh, of Spain. A papal decree in, 19, in 1493 had assigned all land in the New World, west of 50 degrees W, longitude to Spain, and all the land east of that line to Portugal. Magdalene, sorry, Maitland, Maitland, Maitland offered to prove that the East Indies fell under Spanish authority on September 20th. 1519, Midland set sail from Spain with five ships. More than a year later, one of these ships was exploring the topography of South America in search of a water route across the continent. This ship sank, but the remaining four ships searched along the southern peninsula of South America. Finally, they found the passage they sought near 50 degrees as latitude. Mageland named this passage the Strait of All Saints, but today it is known, known as the Strait of Mageland. So that is the other one. This is a little bit more um, complicated. It's of course not as easy as the one we had before, but still a challenge is always gonna be great. So who would like to practice this one? Who would like to practice this paragraph? Okay, Rodrigo Mendoza. So when you're ready, Rodrigo, you can get started. Okay, teacher. Um, in the 60th century, an age of great marine and territorial exploration, Ferdinand Magellan led the first expedition to sail around the world. As a young Portuguese noble, he served the king of Portugal, but that became involved in the quagmire of political uh, intrigue at court and lost the king favor. After he was dismissed from service by the king of Portugal, he offered to serve the future emperor Charles V uh, of Spain. A papal decree of 1493 uh, have assigned a land in the new world, west of 50 degrees, uh, well, longitude to Spain, and all the long is of the line to Portugal. Magallan offered to prove that East Indies fell under Spain authority on September uh, 20, 1590. Magallan set sail from Spain with five ships. More than a year later, when the this ship was exploring the photography of South America in search of water brought across the continent, this ship sank, but the remaining four ships searched along the southern peninsula of South America. Finally, they are found the passage 
the sun a uh, 50 degrees is longitude. Magallan named this passage the strip of all saints, but today it is known as the strip of Magallan. All right, pretty good, very good, great. So it's not uh, easy. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's a little no, bit it's complicated. Difficult. Yeah, it's yeah. difficult. Uh, now, for example, we have words like this one here, quagmire. Do you have any idea of what's the meaning of this word, quagmire? Rodrigo? Um, no, teacher. No? All right. So uh, uh, quagmire is basically as if we were talking about um, arenas movedizas. You know, it's like a situation like that, like, uh, some land that will basically, um, you know, sink. As, as you are trying to go by it. So yeah, a quagmire will basically refer to that. Or, you know, you can also use it when you're talking about a situation that is complicated, something that um, is difficult to do. So you can also uh, refer to it as a quagmire. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, one of those, sorry guys, I'll have to stop sharing for a bit because I want to connect back into my, um, my house's Wi-Fi. I think it's back, so. I'll try to see if I can connect it back. One second. Um, hmm. Here we go. Okay, so um, let's continue then. There we go. Um, so I will show you the next reading because I am also interested in you guys getting to see all of them. So I will show you the next one um, to see, you know, if anyone would like to practice with this one. This is about Mary Curie. So uh, this is probably one of the ones that is also a little bit hard, but entertaining. So here I go. Mary Curie. Mary Curie was one of the most accomplished scientists in history. Together with her husband, Pierre, she discovered radium, an element widely used for treating cancer, and studied um, uranium and other radioactive substances. Pierre and Mary's amicable collaboration later helped to unlock the secrets of, an, of the atom. Mary was born in 1867 in Warsaw, Poland, where her father was a professor of physics at the age of, uh, uh, sorry, at an early age, she displayed a brilliant mind and a uh, blithe personality. Her great exuberance for learning prompted her to continue with her studies after high school. She became disgruntled, however, when she learned that the university in Warsaw was close to women. Determined to receive a higher education, she defiantly left Poland and in 1891 entered the Sorbonne, uh, a French university where she earned her master's degree and doctorate in physics. Mary was fortunate to have studied at Sorbonne, Sorbonne with some of the greatest scientists of her day, one of whom was Pierre Curie. Mary and Pierre were married in 1895 and spent many productive years working together in the physics laboratory. So there we have it. This one is about Mary Curie. So once again, we have a few things, a few words in there that are going to be tricky, but who would like to try this one? Who would like to try reading about Mary Curie? Okay, Jonathan. Great. Very good. Um, so go ahead, Jonathan. Well, Mary Curie was one of, of the most accomplished scientists scientist in the story together with her husband Pierre she discovered radium an element widely used for treating cancer and studied uranium and other radioactive substances Pierre and Mary's amicable collaboration later helped to unlock the secrets of the atrium Mary was born in 1867 in Warsaw Poland where her father was professor of physics at an early age she displayed a bright mind and a bleed personality 
her great exuberance for learning prompt her to continue with her studies after high school. She became disgruntled, however, when she learned that the university in Warsaw was close to women, determined to receive a higher education. She finally left Poland in, in 1891, entered to Sorbonne, a French university where she earned her master's degree and doctoral and physics. Mary was fortunate to have studied of the Sorbonne with some of the greatest senses of her day, one of whom was Pierre Curie. Mary and Pierre were married in 1895 and spent many productive years working together in the C6 laboratory. Okay, very good. Great, there we go. So hard. Uh, yeah, it was a bit trickier than the one before. Now, um, so we have some words here that are simply synonyms, okay, for more common words. For example, amicable, this basically refers to something uh, similar to saying friendly, you know. Amicable would be well, well replaced by the word friendly, friendly collaboration. So, yeah, it's it's just, you know, a little bit of a switch there. Uh, then we have a word like blithe personality. This is similar to saying joyful or happy, you know? So this is simply referring to someone who is, you know, just like out there, some, someone who is um, happy and, and, and uh, yeah, great to watch maybe. Then we have, well, this word, I think it's easy, right? Prompt is like when you get uh, like the impulse that you need, like the, you know, the, the, the push, uh, or the paddle on your back that you need to go ahead and do something. Then, these runlets. So this word, these runlets is used when you are disappointed. When you learn something that you don't like, so you are disappointed. You feel sad or you feel um, lied to, if you want to say it like that. So yeah, this runlet, you know, it's like, yeah, I don't feel the best. I feel disappointed. And uh, I think those are the words that are like weird or different here. Uh, now, anyone else would like to try this one? Uh, I can. Okay. Can I? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Mary Curie uh, was, one of, uh, was one of the most accomplished scientists in history. Together with her husband, Pierre, she discovered radium, an element widely used for treating cancer and studied uranium and other radioactive substances. Pierre and Mary's amicable collaboration later helped to unlock the secrets of the atom. Mary was born in 1867 in Warsaw, Poland, where her father was a professor of physics at an early age, she displayed a brilliant mind and a light personality. Her great exuberance for learning prompted her to continue with her studies after high school. She became disgruntled. disgruntled. However, when she learned that the university in Warsaw was close to women, a determined to receive a higher education. She definitely left Poland and in 1881 entered the Sorbonne, a French university where she earned her master's degree and doctorate in physics. Mary was fortunate to have studied at the Sorbonne with some of the greatest scientists of her day, one of whom was Pierre Curie. Mary and Pierre were married in 1895 and I spent many productive years working together in the physics laboratory. Okay, great, very good. Great pronunciation and great pace as well. So yeah, that's basically how we're supposed to do it. Um, And uh, it seems, you know, as a very- What is the meaning of a defiantly she Defiantly. Defiantly. Uh, it's you, like definitely. No, defiantly no? is that's when you go against against a rule. Like you are um uh, uh, yeah, like uh breaking against. the rule. Defiantly, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. You're going against uh -huh. something. So you are uh -huh. um like 
defying, no, ¿cómo sería? Eh, desafiar. Desafiar, sí. Está como mm -hmm. desafiando el, el sistema. So, defiantly, okay. she left Defiant. Poland because they didn't, uh, they didn't let her study there and she mm -hmm. went to French to study, you know, because she wanted to do it. So, yeah, defiantly, it's like when you're not willing to be stopped by a simple rule and you just search your way around it. So, yeah, defiantly. Are you going to send us that uh, reading? Because there are a lot of words that I I haven't seen before. Okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. I can share it with you guys. Yeah, no problem. All right. So, yeah, uh, right after the class, I will do. Now, I want to share with you the last one. And probably we may have time, you know, for someone else um, to go ahead and read it. This one has many words that are interesting. Uh, so, hopefully, you know, we'll have the time. So, Mount Vesuvius. This is the last reading. Mount Vesuvius, a volcano located between the ancient Italian cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum, has received much attention because of its frequent and destructive eruptions. The most famous of these eruptions occurred in the AD 79. The volcano had been inactive for centuries. There was little warning of the coming eruption, although one account unearthed by archaeologists says that a heart rain and a strong wind has disturbed the celestial calm during the preceding night. Early the next morning, the volcano poured a huge river of molten rock down, the, down upon Herculaneum, completely burying the city and filling the harbor with coagulated lava. Meanwhile, on the other side of the mountain, cinders, stone, and ash rained down on Pompeii. The sparks from the burning ash ignited the combustible rooftops quickly. Large portions of the city were destroyed in the conflagration. Fire, however, was not the only cause of destruction. Poisonous sulfuric gases saturated the air. The heavy gases were no buoyant in the atmosphere and therefore sank towards the earth and suffocated people. So, as I said, it's a tricky one. But now, uh, I think I do, or we do have time for one person to go ahead and read it. So who would like to try Mount Vesuvius? Okay, so we have a challenger. Jonathan, great. Go ahead. Well, all is practice. Yeah, well, that's, that's amazing. Mount Vesuvius, a volcano located between the ancient Italian cities of Pompeii and Erg. Culenium has received much attention because of its frequent and destructive eruptions. The most famous of these eruptions occurred at in AD 79. The volcano had been inactive for centuries. There was a little warning of the coming eruption, although one account unearthed by archaeologists archaeologist, says that a hard rain and a strong wind and destroyed the celestial calm during the preceding night. Early the next morning, the volcano poured a huge river or molten rock down upon Herculaneum, completely burying the city and filling the harbor with coal coagulated lava. Meanwhile, meanwhile, on the other side of the mountain, cinders, stones, and hash rained down on Pompeii, sparks from the burning has ignited the combustible rooftops quickly. Large portions of the city were destroyed in the conflagration. Fire, however, was not the only cause of destruction. Poisonous sulfuric gases saturated the air. These half gases were not budding in, uh, in the atmosphere and therefore sank toward the earth and suffocated people. Okay, so we're not going to have time for me to explain all of the words that we have here. Now, the one that I love, okay, and it was one that I found very hard to pronounce myself the first time I saw it, was this one, unearth it, okay? So, earth it basically means that it's something that has been buried, you know, it's something that is underground. So, unearth it is basically the act of rediscovering this. So, something that, you know, you have to take away some of the soil, some of the sand, some of the earth that is on top of it. So unearth it is like basically saying excavated. But in this case, it's not necessarily excavated because when you do an excavation, it's like, you know, you're actually digging with like, um, like equipment and everything. But when you do unearthing, 
it's only with like brushes and, and delicate things because you want to find out what happened there. So uh, that's one of the one of the many words here that are, you know, tricky or hard to know. Now, I would, of course, love to have more time, you know, to share with you guys and to um, uh, make you all read. But that's not going to be possible tonight. Maybe, maybe we can do it at the end of the course. You know, most of the time um, we have one or two days free at the end of all courses. So if we do have the same thing happening this time, we're going to do, of course, some reading at the end of this course. But uh, it has been interesting. And I love the way that you guys are doing it because you do seem, you know, to be ready to go ahead and and, and read these hard things because I have... Um, experience complications myself but you guys are doing amazing so thank you very much thank you for your participation and um everything we have done tonight so hope i'll see you tomorrow again and uh, have a really good night so bye-bye for now thank you see you tomorrow bye. you're welcome bye-bye